Hi. I got nothing. I I I got nothing. Um. If. Give me a second. Just give me a second. Let me let me cook up something here. Um. Liquidize your assets and invest in crypto. I don't know. What is it? Twenty-year-old Lene and her 16-year-old sister Trish were looking forward to the holiday season as they headed to their family's cabin in Utah, a place they fondly refer to as TD's Tranquility. At the time, the TD family viewed it as an escape from tragic. The no sound effects, but we just tested it. It worked. <laughs> yeah. Can you guys not hear it? Don't edit the pause out for the YouTube video. I never do. Bruh. I never do. World, but it would soon become a place of unimaginable <laughs> horrors. Now to say the cabin was isolated would be a total understatement. Oh, an isolated cabin. Mountains, roughly two and a half miles off Hopefully the nothing road, bad happens. It could only be accessed by snowmobiles in the winter. It was Christmas time in 1990. And according to Lene, her mother and grandmother had spared no detail when decorating their cabin for the holidays. My mom even had our Christmas stockings hung under the fireplace mantle, she remembered. On December 22nd, the TD family left the cabin and headed to Salt Lake City, where they planned to wrap up some last minute shopping. Naturally, the thought of intruders breaking into the cabin while they were gone was far from their minds. But unbeknownst to anyone, two very dangerous men had done just that. As they made their way back, they were completely unaware that two ruthless killers were lying in wait and had even been videotaping themselves opening presents from under their tree. What? what? Okay. That's, that's fucking weird. Is it? Fucker. Lene got back to the cabin first that afternoon with her mother Kay and grandmother Beth. She raced inside to warm her hands under hot water, but right away spotted something strange out of the corner of her eye. It appeared to be a figure darting behind the refrigerator. And at first, she just thought it was one of the cousins they were expecting for a visit. However, Lene's blood ran cold when a frizzy-headed man came out oh, from behind the refrigerator holding a gun. <clears throat> then as her mother and grandmother came into view, Another man wearing her father's sweatshirt and thick Coke bottle glasses emerged from a back bedroom with a gun. Assuming the motive was robbery, Kay briefly pleaded with the intruders to take whatever they wanted, but they responded by opening fire on the women. <laughs> Lene watched in sheer terror Jesus as her mother Christ. fell to the floor, turning briefly only to see her grandmother get shot. Jesus Christ! 76-year-old Beth gasped for air. One I think this... Okay, you don't have to fucking describe, like... Her last moments in detail. Her grandmother gasping for air on the floor, bleeding, guts flopping out. Like, no. Just, she died. That's all you have to say. That's it. Final time before <coughs> the cabin went dead silent. As Lene begged the men to call paramedics, they ignored her and went about throwing her mother and grandmother's bodies off the balcony. Lene recalled one of them stopping to vomit in the bathroom and exclaiming, This is sick. This is gross. This is disgusting. Lene's thoughts went instantly to her sister and father, Rolf, who would be returning any minute. She frantically tried to devise a plan to keep them safe, but just moments later, the sound of the snowmobiles could be heard, and one of the men grabbed her from behind, wrapping his arm around her neck and pressing the barrel of the gun to her back. Rolf and Trish pulled into the driveway and were immediately ambushed by the other man, who led them into the cabin at gunpoint. People love the fucked inside. up shit. Yeah. <clears throat> Dude, that's why I can't watch, uh, what's his name? Disturbing sometimes. Is that his, I think that's his user. Because he goes into fucking, or Shrouded Hand, too. They go into, like, 
giga detail of everything. And I'm, sometimes it literally is like, I can't do that. That's too much. Rolf saw that his eldest daughter was being held hostage. With Lene recalling, my dad could see tears in my eyes, and it was an unspoken communication, and he knew at that point that something awful had happened to Mom and Grams. The intruders demanded money from Rolf, and he obliged, tossing whatever was in his pockets onto the floor. Then the man restraining Lene told the other to shoot him. But for reasons unknown, he refused. So the man with Lene took matters into his own hands. His weapon misfired twice, but the third shot struck Rolf directly in the face, and he fell to the floor. As the two young women watched on, the men began dousing the entire cabin in gasoline. Jesus. Which there was plenty of around the cabin for the snowmobiles. They then set the place on fire and demanded the girls load up the snowmobiles and get ready to leave. Doing as instructed, Lene and Trish each got onto a snowmobile with one of the attackers behind them, and they set off, leaving Rolf for dead in the fiery blaze. It seems likely that the man who refused to shoot Rolf could be the man who vomited earlier. Given the physical response to the first killings, as well as the refusal to shoot the father, it appears that one of the men may have been having at least some second thoughts. If this is true, there could be several reasons why he didn't just leave or try to stop the other man. He may have been afraid of repercussions from his partner, who appeared to be calling at least some of the shots. He may have felt that there wasn't a safe way for him to get out of the situation. By choosing to not shoot Rolf, perhaps he felt like he was not as responsible for what happened. Even if one of the assailants didn't want to kill anyone but just agreed to a burglary, under mm. the law, both would still be charged. Yeah. <clears throat> and, it, and it seemed like he knew it was going to happen with the murder <coughs> for a defendant to be guilty of a crime it's not necessary could have shot that his partner do all True. of the acts of the crime for example if two people join in a common purpose to commit a crime each of them is guilty of the crime and is also guilty of any other crime committed by the other in the pursuit to we commit know. the crime this is called acting in concert so even if the two men agree to just burglarize the home but in doing so one assailant shot someone that other assailant can also be charged with that shooting, as it's a natural or likely consequence of committing the burglary. From the back of the snowmobiles, the sisters were secretly trying to find an escape, with Trish later saying, I had all kinds of different plans of how to wreck the snowmobile, how to throw him off into a tree, how to get rid of him, but all I could think of is I couldn't leave my sister. There was no one to help us. There was nowhere to go. Then they passed by the girl's uncle Randy, who at first, simply assumed they were out with new boyfriends for a joyride. However, as he waved to his oh, nieces, man. they ignored him and passed right by out of fear that the intruders might kill him too. When they finally reached the main road, the two men forced Trish and Lene to see the backseat of chess? their family car. Why the hell would you speeding. want to see me play chess of all people? I'm awful. In the way, Trish glimpsed that one of them was also carrying a knife, and when he saw her looking, he said, don't worry, I'm just as good with a knife as I am a gun. Suspicions rising, Randy saw the car pulling out with the girls in the back and tried desperately to make them stop by yelling and waving his arms, but the girls continued to ignore him. At this point, he knew something was terribly wrong, but before he could stop to think, he heard another snowmobile in the distance. The first thing he Paul's noticed Randy? was that the rider wasn't... Was it, was it Randy? Did he survive? ...wearing any protective equipment or warm clothing. But as they got closer, he realized blood was covering the person. Oh my god, he lived! ...in swollen face. Then, it suddenly occurred to Randy. Oh my god, it's my brother. Against all odds, Rolf had survived... Oh, oh, oh wait, Rolf, not Randy, Rolf. ...the horrific encounter by pretending to be dead when he hit the floor. After being shot and set on fire... He managed to rip off his burning clothes and hop on a snowmobile to rescue his daughters. Dude, he could barely muster. The holy shit! What a badass! Strength to tell Randy, I've been shot. <coughs> my wife has been killed, and my daughters have been kidnapped. Randy helped his badly bleeding brother into the back of his car, and he took off after the girls, what trying a all the while badass. to reach service so he could call for help. Finally, as they caught up with the stolen car, Randy's mobile phone came into service, and he called 911 yelling at the operator guys the real i need a Liam helicopter Neeson. now randy gave detailed instructions on where the car was headed and the operator assured him that they had police in the area who would be there soon meanwhile 
Trish and Lene sat terrified in the back of the car as it sped more than 90 miles per hour down Dear the road. Dear Lord. They felt a quick wave of relief when they saw a police vehicle turn around and start following them, but all hope vanished when their captors sent the car plummeting down an embankment. Oh, Officers no. swarmed the crash scene with guns drawn, and miraculously, Trish and Lene emerged oh, from thank the fucking God. wreckage unharmed with their hands in the air yelling that they were hostages. Dude, dad of the fucking year. Dad of the, the millennia. Holy the shit. The two men surrendered and were instructed to get down on their knees with their hands behind their heads. So the dad Trish could beat them up. Their entire family was dead back at the cabin. So they were shocked to learn that their father was being airlifted from Randy's car to the nearest hospital in critical condition. The two suspects were identified as Von Lester Taylor and Edward Stephen Deli, parolees who had recently run away from a halfway house they'd been staying at while looking for employment. The two men were previously Dude, in prison. Dude, why? This guy looks fucking creepy. He looks like the Joker. This guy looks like a TikTok fuckboy. And this guy looks like the Joker. And for arson and aggravated burglary, respectively, but were now each facing first degree murder charges. In addition, they were also charged with attempted first degree murder, aggravated kidnapping, aggravated assault, Theft, arson, and failure to heed a police signal. Yeah, he looked stop. junk rat looking ass. Aggravated has added to the crime when something is done to make the circumstances <laughs> of the crime more serious. Here, the kidnapping and assault charge are aggravated because they committed these acts while brandishing a weapon. Authorities rushed to the crime scene, where the top floor of the cabin was still on fire. They quickly located the deceased bodies of Kay and Ruth and noted countless bloodstains and bullet holes tarnishing the once tranquil vacation spot. Jesus Investigators Christ. also uncovered several vital pieces of evidence, including a tape from inside the family's video camera. The shocking footage revealed that robbery was not their only motive, and that the attackers had clearly intended to murder the family. They ate the family's food and even opened their Christmas presents on camera while Jesus waiting to Christ. strike. It later came out that they had called a friend back at the halfway house and bragged about their plans to kill a family and steal their car. Vaughn and Edward reportedly chose the location because one of them was familiar with the area, and when they discovered that people were home at the TD family cabin, they knew they found a target. With evidence mounting against him, Vaughn pleaded guilty to the murder charges in 1991. He opted Charlie for a penalty Booth phase and hearing before a jury Dirk, rather than a judge and was sentenced to death. Edward's trial took place a few weeks later, with his attorney arguing that Vaughn had done all of the shooting. Trish and Lene gave heartfelt testimonies, confirming that Vaughn had been the one holding Lene around the neck and that he was the one who shot Rolf. Edward was ultimately found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Good! While the family wasn't happy about Edward's sentence, they took immense satisfaction in seeing the look on his face. Oh, okay. Because uh, they wanted the death sentence, I assume. Which, I mean, yeah. That too. <laughs> he realized Rolf was, in fact, alive. Trish later stated, <coughs> I remember watching the look on Deli's face as he came in seeing my father, and it was very apparent to me that he didn't know my father had survived, and the look on his face was just priceless. Pause. Okay. That looks like Ethan. Can't even see that now. Oh, like in the background? Not really. My dad survived. I mean, we won. I can kind of see it. In 2001, Edward reached out to Lene in a letter expressing remorse for his actions and claiming to no longer be the same evil person. Oh, shut up. After nine years of contemplation, she courageously accepted his apology as part of her road to recovery. On the other hand, Von Taylor is a- Fuck that, dude. What do you mean? Accept his apology? Yeah, sorry I killed your whole family. I'm a better person now. Oh, I forgive you. What? Whoa, whoa, what, 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 is that, is this a religious thing? Is that what it, that's always what it is. If forgiving the person who murders your entire family. It's attempted to appeal. I don't know, bro. Multiple times. I don't know about that, that one. Edward did all of the shooting on that faithful. <clears throat> the remorseless killer even claimed he had brain damage in an effort to be spared the death penalty. The vast majority of defendants that are given a life sentence or the death penalty try to appeal their case. If Von Taylor could actually prove that he had such severe brain damage and therefore wasn't competent to stand trial, his appeal would have been granted. That, however, was not the case here. 
Go ahead. The apology letter that Edward sent to Lene may have appeared to be genuine since she eventually decided to accept it. From a psychological perspective, it would make sense if the man who was physically sick during the attacks, the man who refused to shoot Rolf, and the man who expressed remorse to the family were all the same person. We don't know if that is the case here. However, it does appear that Von Taylor failed to take responsibility for his actions. It appears that he lied when he claimed that Edward did all of the shooting. Is yeah, the he he seems like he seems like the asshole here. Seems like the other guy actually regrets the throw up dude. Probably regrets it. Doesn't deserve forgiveness, but he probably regrets it. Well, this guy is just trying to save his own ass. Has identified Vaughn as the one who shot Rolf. Pathological lying, lack of guilt, and failure to take responsibility are all traits of a psychopath. In 2020, the U.S. District Court Judge Tina Campbell made a shocking decision to overturn Bond's sentence, stating he'd not what? been given a fair trial. Oh, but don't worry. It was reversed in 2021 by a federal appeals court, and Bond's now back on death row. Okay, good. What? Huh? What do you mean didn't get a fair trial? 2008, surrounded by his loved ones, and his daughters will forever remember him as the hero that saved their lives. As for Lene yeah. Trish, they refuse to let this tragedy define them and have since rebuilt the cabin in the mountains where they enjoy spending time with their families without fear. Because, as their father once said, lightning never strikes twice in the same location. Bruh, I would not go back. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a weird person. I don't know. I, I would never go back. All, all it would do is just make me think of what happened. And just like that, we're on to our next case. When Todd Dupree said goodbye to his wife Nancy as she headed off to work, he had no way of knowing that it would be the last time he'd ever see her alive. However, what initially seemed like a cut and dry case ultimately transformed into a high profile fight for justice spanning more than a decade. Born and raised in Texas, Nancy yeah, exactly. was a vibrant 20 How would you be able to sleep? Like being in the same area where you just came to, to back to your a comfortable vacation house only to just have your entire family die? And then go back to the same area and be like, ah, I'm totally not scared. Sure, the guys are in jail, but fuck. Old with a devoted <coughs> husband and a young daughter they named Sylvia. On October 24th, 1988, Nancy arrived for her shift at an Austin Pizza Hut at around 7 in the morning to prepare pizza dough before the restaurant opened. The young wife and mother was a reliable employee who would often work alone in the morning, and this day was no different. Still, her manager called just to make sure everything was going all right, but no one answered the work phone. After several more failed attempts at reaching Nancy by phone, her manager decided to check things out at the restaurant around 9.30. Upon entering the building, he quickly made a horrifying discovery. Nancy was clinging to... I was about to say a bad joke, but I, I held it in. ...life in a pool of blood, and she'd been tied up with her own bra. She was rushed to the hospital, but tragically succumbed to her injuries later that day. An autopsy concluded that her cause of death was from a single gunshot wound to the back of her head. Furthermore, the medical examiner noted that it appeared she had been assaulted prior to her murder. Wonderful. Back at the crime scene, investigators found no signs of forced entry and believed the motive to be robbery, as there was money missing from the restaurant's safe. While there wasn't much evidence to work with, at least not back then, a 20 you, you think that's that's a robbery? What? Like a robbery, yeah, if someone dies, it's like, oh, they kill him, get out with the money, right? A robbery is not assault, abuse for a while, and then murder. Basically torture the girl, leave her for dead, and then get the money. What? How would you ever think that was a robbery? The two caliber shell casing was discovered next to Nancy's body. Then, two mm. weeks after the murder, 22-year-old Chris Ochoa and 19-year-old Richard Danzinger <coughs> went to the Austin Pizza Hut for a bite to eat. 
The two were roommates who worked at another nearby Pizza Hut restaurant, but employees found their behavior... Okay, first of all, why the hell would you be eating at a Pizza Hut? That's like, that's like, what, tier... That's like, probably, tier D when it comes to other pizza restaurants. ...that day, suspicious. Beyond inquiring about her death to the security guard, cheesy crust. they also Dude, appeared... Their cheesy crust is literally, they just take the, you know those, uh, those string cheeses that you get when you're younger? They take one of those little hot dog cheeses and then just roll it up in the dough. It's not good. It's gross. Here ...to make a toast to Nancy's memory, which Ugh. prompted multiple mentions to the police. Investigators interviewed the two men as well as Richard's girlfriend, Donna, who claimed they'd been together that evening. But just two days later, Chris confessed to his involvement in Nancy's murder and even implicated Richard in the crime as the shooter. The roommates were subsequently arrested and placed so in jail blame game. while they awaited trial. Chris accepted a plea deal in which he would testify against <clears throat> Little Richard. Little Caesars is great? Okay. Little Caesars pizza is just a step above frozen pizza. Okay? We got frozen pizza. Little Caesars. Pizza Hut. Domino's. Um, actually, Emo's. Emo's is, is probably below... Um... What's it called? What was the first one? <laughs> what was the first? Little Caesars. It's below Little Caesars. Emo's is awful. Emo's is trash. There's like Mod Pizza. There's a uh, Papa John's is up there. Um, there's this local place around here that is like up here. Yeah, Pizza Hut's down. Death penalty there. taken off the table. It's common practice to give deals to one defendant in a multi-defendant case in exchange for their testimony when the prosecution can use it to prove their case. Richard's trial began in January 1990 with him pleading not guilty. Chris testified against his friend, but as a shock to the prosecution, he changed his story on the stand and said he shot Nancy, not Richard. Still, after just seven and a half minutes of deliberation, and he yes, laugh with, you don't laugh prison. at me. Now, it was Chris's turn to face the music. Instead of the death penalty, he pleaded guilty and was also sentenced to life imprisonment. Three years into his prison sentence, Richard was brutally attacked by a fellow inmate. Of course. While he survived, he was left with permanent brain damage. Oh, God. He was eventually transferred to a psychiatric prison in 1997. However, a year earlier in 1996, something happened that would turn this entire case upside down. A man named Joseph Marino, who was serving time in another Texas prison for robbery and assault, sent a chilling letter to the police saying he had been the one to kill Nancy. Wait. The fuck were they framed? The priest. He cited newfound religious beliefs as his reason for confessing. Oh my god. That's oh dude that that's always what it is. That these fucking losers, man. Every time someone gets put in prison, oh, I've changed. I'm confessing because I found God. Shut the fuck up. God, I am a born again Christian. All of my sins have been forgiven. All of those people I murdered. As he stated in the letter, I am 100% responsible for the death, the robbery, <clears throat> assault, and murder of Mr. Priest. Joseph may have wanted the chance to clear his conscience, as it's possible the guilt had been eating away at him over the years. However, it's also within the realm of possibility that he wanted to take credit <laughs> for the crime and show everyone that he had literally gotten away with murder. Joseph was already True. serving three life sentences for aggravated robberies when he confessed to killing Nancy, so he may have felt that the attention and notoriety he would receive would be worth any additional jail time he might get. Additionally, Joseph told them that they could find evidence at his home, linking him to the crime. While the Austin police located a money bag, Nancy's keys, and the gun he claimed Jesus is the murder fixes weapon everything in his residence, true. they still believe- Dude, can he fix that hole in my wall? Is Jesus a handyman? ...believed Chris and Richard were involved. So, yeah. they worked tirelessly for two years to find any sort of connection between the three men. 
It's easy for police to get tunnel vision and confirmation bias in cases once they set their minds on a particular suspect as being guilty. Meanwhile, Joseph kept trying to get his story heard and even wrote a letter to then-Texas Governor George W. Bush saying, You are legally and morally obligated to contact Danzinger and Ochoa's attorneys. The letter went unanswered. Finally, in 1998, authorities Wait, hold notified... Up. Are those guys actually, like, innocent? Wait a second. ...by the district attorney's office of the confession The lawyer says letter. he was a handyman? Okay, I also visited hell Chris yeah. in prison to ask him about the possible... But, like, okay, think about it. If Jesus just, like, appeared in today's world, he was a carpenter, so, like, he only knows how to build, you know, old stuff. <laughs> Like, you know, Jesus time stuff. But does he know shit about plastering a wall? You know, like cutting out the hole, doing the, you putting the hole in, taping it, and doing the plast. Like, does, does he know? He probably doesn't, right? I think he could figure out a spackle. I don't know, man. I don't know. Is Shadow still good? Yeah. My wife is just, uh, Making fun of Shadow because she said that the new bird's better than Shadow. <laughs> Shadow's getting jealous. Accomplice, but he stuck to his original story, insisting that he and Richard had acted alone. Sensing that something was going on in the case, Chris soon changed his mind and decided to reach out to the Wisconsin Innocence Project in 1999. He told them that he'd been coerced into a confession and that he and Richard were innocent. As a result, Yo. the organization requested more advanced DNA testing on the samples collected at the crime scene. And in November 2000, the results... See, this is why, like, after reading that book and shit and learning more about the death penalty, that the death, death penalty is sometimes sketchy. Because these situations, and these situations happen a lot more than, than people know, of people who... Uh, are innocent and put in prison and put on death row. Back. The DNA belonged to Joseph Marino, not <clears throat> Chris or Richard. As it turns out, the DNA testing in 1990 only analyzed a single gene, whereas the new test examined 10. Additionally, a ballistics test confirmed that the gun found in Joseph's home had been the one used to kill Nancy. So on January 16th, 2001, after nearly 13 years Dude, behind bars. 13 years behind bars and brain damage. Chris Ochoa was released from prison at age 34. He was fully acquitted of the crime a few months later. Richard Danzinger was also released a few months later, but the brain damage he sustained during his prison sentence left him needing lifelong care. My God, dude. Is it? No, it's not a cockatiel. It's a Quaker. Take those claims seriously when it comes to Texas cops. The death penalty shouldn't be allowed. It's a slippery slope once you allow government to kill its people. Yeah, on some instances, like where it's, you know, certain. Uh, I don't know. Like sometimes it's like when someone does something so horrendous. <clears throat> sometimes you feel like they deserve it. But at the same time, there's situations like this where innocent people get put on death row. This dude literally got brain damage in 13 years. It's like the ball in video about the guy who got executed for killing his wife and child when it was someone else. Yeah, stuff like that. It happens a lot. Joseph further admitted to investigators that his motive for killing Nancy stemmed from his hatred for a female correctional officer he encountered while serving time in prison for robberies and other crimes. He decided that he would murder a woman who resembled her when he got out. Wow. And that's why he chose Nancy. Finally, he claimed that she had led him into the restaurant that morning because he was wearing a workman's uniform and claimed to be fixing a broken soda machine. Wow. Joseph was ultimately convicted of capital murder and given a life sentence for Nancy's murder. He's already got three. But that still begs the question, why would Chris confess to a crime he didn't commit? <coughs> well, as it turns out, Chris, Richard, and Richard's girlfriend Donna had been interviewed by Detective Hector Polanco, a man known for cracking even the most challenging oh, no. cases. Did he just push him? Did, did they just push him so hard that they just committed? They're just like, yeah, fuck it, I did it. Chris adamantly denied having any knowledge regarding Nancy's murder, but the interview pressed on regardless. 
Meanwhile, in a separate interview room, Donna explained that she and Richard had been together at her home that entire night. Richard also denied having any involvement in the crime, but detectives felt he knew details about the crime that were not public knowledge, although those admissions have never been fully disclosed. Wow. Although Richard never false. So was it just cops being lazy and they're just like, no, confess now, make my job easy. Fully confessed. It's interesting that in 52% of false confession cases that were later exonerated through DNA evidence, the exoneree included facts that weren't public in their confessions. This suggests that giving details about a crime that are not public knowledge may not be quite as indicative of guilt as police may think. As the relentless questioning continued, investigators told Chris that Richard would turn against him <clears throat> and that he... He got life sentence, but the guys who didn't do it got death. Different state, right? Aren't they in a different state? Needed to protect himself. <clears throat> this technique is called the prisoner's dilemma, where the suspect is set up in such a way that both parties choose to protect themselves at the expense of the other. As a result, both participants find themselves in a worse state than if they cooperated with each other. Some speculate that the detectives working this case used questionable techniques to Probably. garner information from him, such as throwing furniture and showing him graphic autopsy photos. Two days after the questioning began, Chris buckled under the pressure and signed a written confession that listed Richard as his accomplice. Wow. At the time, he believed this was the only way to avoid death by lethal injection. The confession stated that he and Richard had entered the Pizza Hut using stolen keys and that together they had assaulted and killed Nancy. It also included fabricated details of the crime that would haunt the victim's family for over a decade. Moreover, Chris's inexperienced defense attorneys didn't believe in his innocence and were solely focused on avoiding the death penalty. Wow. So all it is is literally just everyone being too lazy to actually care about the situation. The detectives, the cops, and the lawyers. So they urged him to testify against <clears throat> Richard and basically just throw him under the bus. It's possible that the reason Chris changed his story about who shot Nancy during Richard's trial is because he felt guilty for blaming his friend. He may have felt that since he was now safe from the death penalty, he could try to undo the damage that was done toward Richard. Chris only stuck with his story when the police visited in 1998 because he knew that it would be nearly impossible to secure parole if he started denying his guilt. Chris and Richard ultimately received millions of dollars each in settlements. Okay, good. However, Richard also sued Chris for false incrimination, which he willingly settled over a hefty sum. Of his confession, Chris stated, I know- I mean, What does that even matter at that point? <clears throat> People think no reasonable person would confess to something they didn't do. Who the hell is reasonable in that situation? You're not normal. You're there, never been in trouble before. You've been taught to respect officers with guns. They put you in a room. They've got the badges. What are you going to do? According to the Innocence Project, there have been 375 yeah. DNA exonerations in the yeah, United States. Of right. these, 29% involved false confessions. In 49% of those false confession cases, the false confessor was 21 years old or younger at the time of arrest. It just sounds like they just enjoy scaring younger people into just confessing to something they didn't do. It seems surprising that someone would confess to a murder they didn't commit, but in fact, in 130 of these DNA exoneration cases, the exoneree was wrongfully convicted of murder, with most of these, 62%, involving false confessions. People may falsely confess to a crime as a way to get out of a stressful situation, such as the interrogation, or to avoid they probably They're probably basically getting tortured by being there for so long, and they're just like, I just want this to end. This is just, this is more common and they just don't get Schmidt, exonerated. Which yeah. in this case would be the lethal injection that Chris was threatened with. A suspect may <laughs> also confess in order to access a reward, such as being able to go home or speak with family. In interrogations, police sometimes use high-end inducements, which means that suspects are led to believe that they will receive a lower punishment if they confess, but a higher punishment if they do not confess. Yep. Chris may have felt like there was no way out with some kind of punitive outcome, so he chose to confess in order to get the lesser punishment. All right, on that note, let's move on to our last true crime story. Fear from the intimidation, extremely valid reaction, yeah. And it's just gross that it happens a lot. 
Paramedics responded to the call of two dead bodies at the Durham family home in Sand Lake, Michigan. They had no idea that they were in for the shock of a lifetime. While moving the bodies, one of their supposed murder victims suddenly came to life, unleashing a web of lies and betrayal. Still, huh? just when investigators thought they'd hit a dead end in the case, a most unlikely witness came forward with a chilling account that didn't fly well with anyone. 46-year-old Martin and 49-year-old Glenna Durham were a married couple of 11 years who shared five children from previous relationships. In 1995, Martin was involved in a devastating car accident that horribly damaged the left side of his body and brain. His injuries rendered him disabled and resulted in significant memory loss, thus leaving him unable to work. So the family was forced to rely on Martin's disability checks and whatever the government paid Glenna to care for her husband. Still, their real money troubles came from Glenna's gambling addiction, uh -oh. and she would frequently visit uh -oh. gambling. the casinos. Martin was much more frugal with his spending, so... It, dude, I always feel like it's people who don't... Uh, who are, like, struggling with money that always tend to become gambling addicts. I mean, I guess that makes sense. You know, because they think that they'll make a lot of money from Gamba, but, you know, it's, it's all a scam, and they're just going to lose all their money. So naturally, <laughs> now fuck this lady. What it was? She, she shit. She do something well bad. With him, and the couple <clears throat> often argued about their financial problems. As Martin's physical health continued to deteriorate, Glenna took complete control over their bill payments. But by this point, her gambling addiction had spiraled out uh, of control. Of course. However, when a man showed up to repossess one of their vehicles and don't show Aiden Ross this, dude. You know what's really fucking stupid. It's like, you know, gambling so idolized and shown on so many different platforms and a bunch of different children see it. Like, I literally have first-hand experience with someone who I know that is an insane gambling addict and literally neglects their children, uh, can't pay for anything for their children, uh, literally, like, sell their children's toys just to gamble. Like, it's fucking wild, the shit that they do to get money to gamble. It's, it's crazy. So, like, the gambling shit rubs me way, way more the wrong way than it even used to. It's awful. And people just don't care. Like, these fucking rich assholes with millions of dollars who get millions of dollars in order to gamble free money... So they could show everyone what it looks like. And then everyone's like, oh, I could win just like them. Glenna somehow Teaching convinced children that about, it was all some big like, mistake. Becoming gambling Five years later, the local newspaper up. published a notice about their home going into foreclosure. And Glenna offered her husband the same weak excuse. It seemed like everything was starting to fall apart. Then, in May of that same year, one of the Durham's neighbors noticed that it had been two days since they uh -oh. last saw Martin or Glenna. Uh -oh. The worried neighbor went over to investigate and was <laughs> greeted only by silence, so they ventured further into the house. Upon entering the living room, a gruesome discovery was made. The bodies of Martin and Glenna were sprawled out on the floor. Oh. Martin was dressed in only his underwear, and Glenna was fully clothed with a blanket covering her lower half. There was blood all over the place, and the neighbor struggled to locate a pulse on either body, so they immediately called 911. Paramedics arrived on the scene and found Martin deceased from five gunshot wounds. Glenna also appeared to be dead from injuries to her head, but when emergency workers went to move her body, they were stunned to realize she was still alive. Glenna's breathing was shallow, and her body jolted once before being rushed to the hospital. Did she shoot him and then shoot herself? She was incredibly confused and combative to the point where she needed to be restrained. Medics said she asked several times, Why are you doing this, Marty? Doctors determined Client that Glenna had worked almost minor 12 hours with small children. Oh, God, yeah, take a break. Her bullet wounds Jesus at the Christ. hospital. Go to but sleep. they said she would survive. However, once recovered, Glenna claimed to have no recollection of the events that led to her being shot. An autopsy oh. confirmed that Martin had died from three close-range gunshot wounds to his chest, with two additional rounds fired into his back and lower arm from farther away. It's possible for memory loss to occur following significant trauma, which could be one explanation as to why Glenna allegedly couldn't remember anything about being shot. Meanwhile, back at the Durham home, investigators <clears throat> tried to make sense of the bizarre crime scene. 
Based on the circumstances, they assumed <laughs> a third individual was involved, but found no evidence suggesting a break-in. So Those yeah, close she to Martin either is faking an injury, or... Yeah, she shot herself and she, she didn't First die. Officers I assume that he'd been very wary of intruders and kept his doors locked and deadbolted at all times. Nevertheless, detectives did locate a Ruger single six pistol under a chair in the living room, along with various ammunition scattered throughout the house. The next day, some of the couple's children returned to the home to clean and uncovered a manila envelope in the living room filled with letters written by Glenna. Specifically, the letters seemed to imply that she was planning to take her own life and included apologies of to her loved ones. She even wrote one to her ex-husband, asking him to watch after their children when she's gone. Investigators questioned Glenna about the letters, but she claimed to have no memory of writing them. Ah, Moreover, okay. she told detectives that she had no reason to kill herself or Martin, saying, I wouldn't shoot my husband. I'd be better off divorcing him and leaving him. Her explanation. That's, that's what I'm saying to all the people who end up killing their significant other. <laughs> seemed fishy to investigators, but they didn't have the evidence needed to file any charges. So they tried to glean as much information as possible from those close to the Durham family. One relative commented to detectives. She indicated he was a pain in the ass to take care of, and one of these days she was going to kill him. Yeah. Authorities also <laughs> requested access to Glenna's cell phone records, which showed that she had used her internet browser the day before the shooting to look up Ruger pistols. Mm. The web pages visited included... Mm. Ruger Inside Out, Ruger Safety Playbook, <coughs> and Ruger New Model Single Six Single Action Revolvers. Mm. But of course, Glenna denied ever visiting those sites from her phone, nope. alleging nah, that she only remember. used her phone to play games. Then someone else started <laughs> talking, and I'll give you a hint. It wasn't Glenna. Instead, a video released by Martin's ex-wife showed his beloved pet African Grey Parrot, the only witness to the Wait! Wait, I think I've seen this. The shooting, reenacting what appeared to be their final fight. In the video, which quickly went viral. Yeah, I've seen this video. I've seen this. The bird hero, yeah. The parrot moves from side to side while changing its voice to reflect two people bickering. Possibly Martin and Glenna. Dude, poor bird. <clears throat> the the because I'm pretty sure like when you know like birds experience traumatic shit and it fucks with them and I think that's why he's probably repeating it. Finally, the bird exclaims, "Don't shoot," which some family members strongly Birds are so was smart. The last yeah. Thing Martin ever said. Martin's ex-wife stated, This story was on Beyond Belief. To listen to the whole two-minute rant and to know Marty and to know Glenna and to know the things that they would say to each other, it's haunting. My house turns cold. I get chills when I hear it. The shocking video ultimately put even more pressure on the police to make an arrest, but they still wanted to ensure the case against Glenna would hold this up This is why trial. birds are epic, So the chat. lead prosecutor communicated with experts awesome. worldwide about using the parrot's statements as evidence, but couldn't justify the admission. This evidence is extremely interesting from a legal and evidentiary perspective. It is obviously highly unusual to have an animal as a witness that makes a statement. All out-of-court statements, whether by a person or, in this case, an animal, <laughs> is considered hearsay. Hearsay evidence is usually inadmissible at trial. The reason hearsay is barred is evidence. Here, how are you going to call that hearsay? It's a fucking bird. What? What do you mean hearsay? That All they do is repeat what they hear. It, that's not... I mean, technically, it's hearsay, but it's like... You can't... A bird can't do that. That doesn't count. It's hearsay because they hear him say it. It's literally hearsay. No, okay, listen. It's not hearsay. The bird is not saying, oh yeah, oh, I heard him say this. No, thank you, Sid, for the sub. All right, no, it's an anonymous gifter. Oh shit, thank you for the gift. Guys, a, a bird can't be like, he can't lie. 
He he can't just be like, oh yeah, I heard this guy. Uh, he said don't shoot. No, the bird just repeats what he hears. It can't be hearsay. You, you, it's not like a bird can just like lie. Like where else do you think he heard? Don't fucking shoot. <clears throat> Evidence is because one cannot cross-examine the person who is making the statement, since that person cross-examine the bird now. <laughs> I want to see that. Not in court. This case is extremely unique in that the parrot could technically be presented in court, but there's no way to cross-examine a parrot, and its statements cannot be deemed reliable. Just when it appeared the trail was the running bird cold, is clearly police a paid received actor. results from the ballistics test run on the pistol found under the chair, which confirmed it to be the murder weapon. Moreover, handwriting tests concluded that Glenna had been the one to write the There's so many cases of parrots ratting on people, yeah. Roughly one year after his death, investigators finally had enough evidence to arrest Glenna and charge her with Martin's murder. In July 2017, Glenna Durham stood trial Give the for her crimes, a lie detector with the prosecution tests. arguing that she had intended to take her own life along with Martin's, <laughs> but backed out on the plan. They also emphasized Glenna's extensive gambling habits and the couple's crippling financial issues as a motive. The theory that Glenna was planning on taking her own life as well. So it's all Glenna's fault. So she kills her husband. So the reason that they're in a huge financial issue is all because of her. And then she kills her husband. Cool. Makes sense. Given the apology letter she left behind. If she'd been planning to kill only Martin and pretend that they'd both been shot by a third person, it seems unlikely that she would have left such incriminating letters in the home. In addition, it's possible that Glenna may have been experiencing caregiver fatigue or burnout, which is a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion as a result of caring for her husband after his car accident. In fact, one symptom of caregiver burnout is feelings of wanting to hurt yourself or the person for whom you are caring. There was clearly no squawking in the jury because after just one day of deliberating, ah, he said squawking. Glenna was convicted of first degree murder and a felony firearm charge. She was sentenced to life in prison without a chance for parole and is currently carrying out her term at a women's correctional facility in Michigan. Good. You don't give a shit about your stupid, uh, whatever it's called. Oh, I'm so tired of taking care of my husband. Shut up. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribe? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. Turn. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.